there are more Americans dying of drug overdoses than at any time in modern history. Research shows over 5 million Americans are struggling with an opioid addiction. We're working with states on uh, naloxone distribution uh, plans as part of their state opioid response uh, you know, funding and, and work. And so the goal there is to work with states to develop naloxone distribution plans and to provide support around uh, disseminating naloxone broadly. Dr. Miriam Delphin Rittman is the Assistant Secretary for Substance Abuse with the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services and the Administrator of SAMHSA, the agency that's empowered to address these challenges. And this is Conversations on Healthcare. Dr. Uh, Delphin Rittman, uh, welcome to Conversations on Healthcare. Oh, thank you so much for having me. Good, good to see you both. Uh, that's great. You know, you testified at the Senate hearing about a continued rise of overdose deaths uh, linked to fentanyl. And I, I think one thing that was striking was the number of times the hearing circled back to blaming China for making fentanyl and Mexicans for helping to get it across our borders. It just seems like denial to view this as mostly a border security problem doesn't really do justice. Uh, it goes a lot deeper. I wonder if you could share uh, with our listeners your thoughts. Yeah, I mean, certainly, you know, what we're seeing is that fentanyl is um, increasingly contributing to the overdose deaths um, and uh, the really troubling patterns and trends that we're seeing. Uh, we know that fentanyl is it's easy to manufacture, easy to uh, uh, access, unfortunately. Uh, and our data shows that it is significantly contributing to the to the most recent patterns and trends that we're seeing. Um, you know, the thing that we've been focusing on certainly, or certainly one thing anyway, is just increasing access to treatment. Um, you know, letting people know that services and supports are available, but as part of that, also. Uh, you know, working to distribute naloxone far and wide. Um, in fact, we're working with states on uh, naloxone distribution uh, plans as part of their state opioid response, uh, you know, funding and, and work. And so the goal there is to work with states to develop naloxone distribution plans and to provide support around uh, disseminating naloxone broadly. Um, in fact, we'll be doing a policy academy later in the summer uh, to bring states together to share sort of lessons learned, what's working, what they're seeing um, around naloxone distribution is, is certainly is just one strategy uh, to address the patterns and trends that we're seeing. Well, uh, Dr. Delphin Rittman, uh, the COVID bad pandemic certainly brought us a lot of bad news over these last couple of years, but there was one uh, sort of bright spot, positive development uh, that we've read about. The percentage of young people who report uh, drug use dropped significantly in 2021. Um, officials have said the pandemic uh, led to teens spending less time with the so-called bad influences at school, maybe more time with parents. Uh, do you agree with that? Are there lessons here for us that come out of the pandemic? Um, you know, there are definitely lessons from the pandemic that we're, you know, leveraging and, and working to sort of build, uh, you know, some of our programming and thinking around, um, you know, for example, I mean, one thing that, you know, we're finding is that, uh, you know, some young, young people did report having troubles um, through the pandemic and still experiencing some of those ripple effects. Um, you know, some of our data showed uh, that young people were reporting higher rates of anxiety, higher rates of depression. Uh, and so certainly some of our programming and, and uh, you know, resources and funding. And in fact, the president uh, also in his uh, last two State of the Unions, uh, you know, mentioned that focusing on mental health, uh, particularly for young people, is a priority for the administration. It's certainly one of the SAMHSA priority areas uh, and something we're focusing on to, to really be able to strengthen uh, the overall health and wellness of children, youth and families uh, across the nation. Well, uh, really focusing on children's well-being. I'm wondering if you could fill us in on your agency's new report that provides a really a comprehensive overview about LGBTQI plus youth. Uh, and the researchers found that the pervasive discrimination, rejection and bullying of youth has led to uh, a nationwide mental health crisis. But your agency really has some resources for bullying prevention. I'm wondering if you could sh share your strategy on this intervention. Yeah, absolutely. You know, so for one, you know, I encourage folks um, do check out our website. 
uh, you know, we have a broad range of resources and content related to um, LGBT, uh, LGBTQ mental health. Um, we most recently put out, uh, you know, a report related to, uh, you know, SOGI, uh, you know, uh, positive change, mm -hmm. uh, you know, efforts and approaches to working with uh, LGBTQ youth. Um, but certainly our website has a, a broad range uh, of content there. We know bullying is real. Um, we know young people report um, just a, a, a range of impacts related to bullying in terms of impacts on self-esteem, you know, impacts on some sense of self, um, contributing to thoughts of suicide. Um, one thing that we, we put in place specifically related to LGBTQ uh, youth is if, uh, you know, young people, uh, you know, dial 988. So, you know, that's our new suicide prevention crisis yeah. lifeline. Uh, if they dial 988 um, or chat and, of course, text, um, you know, they can be connected into the LGBTQ uh, specific uh, 988 uh, network. Uh, so it's a press three option. If they dial 988, press, press three. Um, or of course, chat and text. They can be connected uh, to someone with who will work with them in a compassionate way uh, to, to manage whatever they're, they're experiencing. But we do have a specific sub network um, that we're piloting currently um, around uh, LGBTQ uh, uh, youth mental health uh, through the 988 uh, crisis lifeline. You know, that 988 uh, crisis line is so important. Maybe talk a little bit about the role you're playing. I, I'm not sure it's really caught on as much, I, I, but I'm, my, uh, I know the need exists. Uh, how's the rollout been going? You know, we, you know, I, I just have to say the states have done and the uh, call centers at the local level, it's been such a collaboration across the local state, uh, you know, certainly federal level. Uh, and what we find is that people are reaching out. Um, they are reaching out to connect uh, to the lifeline when we look at the first six months. So, for example, if we compare, you know, it launched in July, so July last year. So if we look at July to the end of the year, July to December, and compare that same time period the previous year, um, we had 892,000 additional call, wow. excuse me, calls, texts, and chats that came in. So 892,000 additional calls, texts, and chats. Um, and what we found is that the um, the text of the chats were, were by and large when we look at some of the you know the uh, content that we have there um, was by and large young young people. Um, so it's you know it's heartening to know that folks are reaching out to get yeah. the support um, that they need, uh, but the numbers certainly let us know that there there is a real need there and that people are struggling. Dr. Delphin Rittman, uh, that ties to uh, a question I wanted to ask you. Uh, there was an article in. New York Magazine that uh, sort of tried to figure out why we're facing a rise uh, in teen suicide. Uh, is it the pressures of social media? Was it the isolation of the pandemic, weak social safety net? And after a lot of detail, the author more or less concluded, we just don't know. I wonder, uh, are you learning anything uh, from the uh, experience of these 800,000 calls? I know they're not all teens, but uh, are you getting a clear picture? This must be very high on the things that you worry about on a daily basis at SAMHSA. Yeah, it, it certainly is something that we're that we're very concerned about. And in fact, we've been, um, you know, whenever we can, sort of leveraging opportunities to connect with young people. In fact, last year we we uh, convened a Black Youth Suicide uh, panel. We've done a number of panels with with uh, young people um, just to see what are their experiences, what are their recommendations uh, as it relates to mental health. Uh, and so, you know, I, I think the report you mentioned uh, it. it all of the above. I mean, young people talk about certainly experiencing, they're still um, struggling with some of the impacts of uh, the pandemic and in terms of uh, the uh, rhythms of daily life, uh, uh, still experiencing some impacts there. Um, but social media, we know, plays a significant role. I mean, there's a lot of stress and in fact, bullying that, that happens through social media or can happen through social media. Uh, and so there are just a range of stressors that young people experience. Um, and some of what we're working on is trying to create multiple entryways into care and trying to create opportunities for people who connect with young people 
um, to recognize when they might be struggling, uh, to, to be able to um, know how to navigate care and connect them to services and supports. Um, and then, of course, there are a number of programs for uh, young people specifically. So Project AWARE, for example, is one of our school-based grants uh, that is geared towards, uh, you know, training school personnel and others around recognizing when young folks are struggling, but also then building sustainable infrastructures um, that are geared towards being able to support uh, children, youth, and family um, mental health, in fact. You know, Assistant Secretary, I know this is something uh, very important to you. Certified community behavioral health clinics, and for folks who may not know what they are, they're really required to serve anyone who uh, want care uh, for mental health or substance abuse, regardless of their ability to pay. They're community-based. You've called them transformative. Uh, why is this model working, and how, how is it expanding? Yeah, so you know, it, it, it's working because I think it's about, I mean, truly about creating no wrong door, um, you know, no wrong door into care and just creating multiple opportunities and entryways. Um, currently, we have about 500 CCBHCs across the country. So it, it's it's been, uh, you know, just a, a pleasure. And we've been thrilled to be able to see and receive the resources to be able to expand them across the country. Um, but, you know, I think they're working also because they provide wraparound services and support. So, um, for example, they provide crisis care uh, 24 hours a day, seven days a week. Uh, and so, you know, easy access to crisis care. Uh, there's, uh, you know, mental health services, substance use services, lifespan care. So support for children, um, for families. Uh, and, and so it's, a, it's a, a whole health model of care. There's also primary care screening and linkage to primary care supports as needed. Um, and so I think as a model of care, um, because it takes that whole health, total person approach, um, and it, it addresses the access issue um, by having you know flexible and, and and broad range hours and quick access. You know, people are typically um, connected in some instances the same day. Many CCBHCs have same day access, um, but then uh, if not that, then within a short period of time, ten days or less, uh, you know, people are connected to care. Um, so I think you put all that together and it's a community-based model that is about meeting people where they're at, um, regardless of their ability to pay or their insurance status. And our, our data is showing that it's, it's making an impact in terms of addressing uh, behavioral health and access to care. Well, well, it's so important. And really, I wanted to follow up about the sort of two models. You've got the, uh, that model and also the federally qualified health center model. How do the two of them work together? Because it seems like uh, there is a lot of seam of opportunity to be collaborative. Yeah, yeah. I mean, one thing we're finding is that there are um, many uh, FQHCs, so federally qualified health centers, that are also CCBHCs. Right. Um, and so that's one scenario that, that we're seeing, uh, you know, increasingly across the country. And so that allows for full um, integrated care uh, because, you know, of course, the, the FQHC provides a primary care and uh, CCBHC behavioral health as well as primary care screening. So it really allows um, a full integrated care approach uh, when there are CCBHCs that are also FQHCs. Um, in the absence of that, though, you know, many communities or many states have sites that are CCBHCs and others that may be FQHCs. Um, and certainly the FQHCs can be a really important linkage site um, for individuals that may be screened and identified to have um, primary care um, uh, areas of concern, the FQHC can then be the site where the person is connected for primary care support. So, um, so there is a natural um, connection there. And, and in fact, we are seeing that in many communities in many states as well. That's great. Well, certainly uh, a big focus of uh, concern and interest uh, must be the workforce, the healthcare workforce, the mental health care workforce, whether in the community clinics, the FQHCs, or just about any place else. And I know uh, your uh, agency uh, has its pulse on that. We'd love to hear about some of the programs that you have for workforce training, both today and tomorrow's uh, mental health care workforce. And, and also, I know you uh, have an interesting history with your agency's minority fellowship program. So sh share a little bit about that and your other uh, workforce training initiatives with us. Yeah, yeah, happy to do that. I mean, workforce is definitely, you know, definitely uh, one of our key priority areas. In fact, we we moved it in our current strategic plan, which is out for public comments. I do encourage folks to take a look at that. Uh, please do send in public comment. Uh, 
uh, workforce was a cross-cutting area. Now it's one of our primary, uh, you know, our key priority areas. Um, and so we're taking, I would say, a multi-pronged approach there. Um, we have programs that are geared towards, you know, strengthening the existing workforce. Um, so offer a broad range of training and technical assistance uh, to the existing workforce through our um, center of excellence, uh, you know, uh, grantees, uh, as well as our training and technical assistance uh, grantees as well. So we have, uh, you know, training and technical assistance sites in terms of mental health, substance use prevention. Uh, we have an African-American center of excellence, older adult, adult center of excellence. Uh, we're about to award soon a Latino American uh, center of excellence. Um, and any one of the tribal center of excellence and training technical assistance centers as well. Um, and they're available to do training and technical assistance to the existing workforce. We know that's a really important thing to ensure that the existing workforce is poised and ready to meet with the individuals who, who they may encounter. Um, but then we're also geared at, and, and working at um, uh, you know, attracting and expanding the current workforce. Um, we know that uh, there's HRSA data that shows that by 2025, we might be upwards of 31,000 FTEs short um, in terms of behavioral health professionals. Um, so through the Minority Fellowship Program, as, as one example, um, we fund uh, fellowship uh, spots in uh, psychology, psychiatry, marriage and family therapy, you know, across behavioral health uh, to folks at the master's or doctoral level. Um, and as you mentioned, that, that program is near and dear to my heart. Uh, I'm a, a, a fellow of the Psychology Minority Fellowship Program. I went through uh, 1990 to 93. Um, and the thing personally that I loved about the program is, you know, there was a payback agreement. And so I had to uh, work in a site uh, that serves diverse groups. And ultimately, that's what the, the fellowship is geared towards, you know, training individuals to be culturally responsive and to work in communities that serve diverse groups. Um, and so, you know, I did my uh, payback work at, at the Yale Department of Psychiatry at the Connecticut Mental Health Center um, and ultimately ended up staying on. And, and we find that that often trainees uh, will stay, will stay in the area where they do some of their training. So um, fellowship programs can make a real meaningful difference in terms of expanding the, uh, the existing workforce. Oh, well, they, they really, they really can. I wanna talk a little bit about intervention strategies. I read recently a psychiatrist wrote a provocative op-ed in the Wall Street Journal where she stated that maybe those dealing with stress and depression do not need a therapist and that we are placing all of our eggs in one basket by thinking therapy is the answer for everyone. Uh, maybe we need more peer groups uh, and peer mental health training. What's your thought about uh, uh, this thought, but also about the broader way that we might approach uh, this burgeoning need that we're seeing all across America? Yeah. You know, I mean, I think, you know, what we hear and, and we hear this a lot from people in recovery and and and, and certainly have witnessed this in, in my own work, you know, over the years is that, you know, everyone's recovery journey is different. Um, you know, people um, connect with and find recovery or, or sort of um, move through their wellness in different ways. And so, um, you know, certainly as SAMHSA, what we're committed to doing is just, as I mentioned before, creating multiple entryways and opportunities mm -hmm. for people to um, experience and find uh, you know, recovery and, and ultimately live full, whole, meaningful lives um, along with any mental health or substance use challenges that they may be experiencing. Um, so, you know, we're working to develop and expand the, uh, you know, certainly the peer recovery uh, workforce and, and peer recovery services and supports. Um, we're thrilled to, to launch our Office of Recovery uh, two years ago now, but uh, it as of uh, last September, we announced that it is fully funded. We have a director of the office, fully staffed. Uh, recently put out the peer certification uh, um, standards, model standards that uh, closed recently for public comment. Um, so that's a robust area of work that we're really excited about. Um, but then we know, of course, for other people, um, that, you know, may connect with or, or find recovery, um, you know, through, uh, you know, traditional mental health or substance use uh, related services. And uh, certainly peer support can be an adjunct or part of that part of the wraparound services and supports um, that a person may experience. So we, we've seen the full gamut in terms of what makes a difference uh, and what helps people uh, move into recovery. Some say, you know, just connecting with another uh, person with lived experience uh, made the difference for them and helped give them hope 
Um, it helped them to understand and see that recovery is real and recovery is possible. Um, and we see, you know, all combinations of, uh, um, you know, people connecting with various forms of support, both formal and informal, um, which ultimately helps to uh, help them on their recovery journey. Well, Dr. Uh, Delphid Rittman, uh, it takes resources to do all of the things that you're uh, trying to do. And President Biden's asking for a big increase in your budget to address the mental health and addiction crisis in America. But uh, it appears Republicans want to cut what they see as discretionary uh, programs. Uh, how are you going to thread this needle as you move forward during this period? Yeah. Um, you know, what I can say is I just so appreciate, you know, this administration support uh, for mental health and substance use, you know, the, the president in recovery, uh, the president mentioned it in his most recent State of the Union, we've got work to do, the job is not done. Uh, and so I appreciate the current president's budget, our budget goes from about 7.2, give or take to 10.8 billion. Uh, and those resources we know are much needed. Uh, our most recent uh, national survey on drug use and health uh, shows, you know, troubling patterns and trends, and ultimately the resources that the president has proposed in the current budget um, to include in, uh, increases in our state opioid response grant, um, to include increases in our mental health and substance use block grant, uh, you know, as well as other discretionary grants, um, that all of those grants and programs ultimately are geared towards helping to uh, you know, uh, to improve the behavioral health of the nation. And so I appreciate that the president's budget uh, includes that increase. And I'm optimistic that, uh, that uh, you know, the president's budget is, is uh, you know, where ultimately where we'll end up. Uh, Assistant Secretary uh, Delphin, you lead what's officially called Substance Abuse uh, and Mental Health Service Administration, but you want to update SAMHSA's name to remove what's called a stigmatizing label of substance abuse. And as you know, this change will require Congress to give it its okay. Why is the change important to you? And uh, how do you answer uh, critics? Um, you know, language matters. And so substance use uh, certainly is, is less stigmatizing than substance abuse. As you think about that change, is that, is that one that... Uh, is, is part of this uh, agenda going forward this year, or do you think you'll, uh, uh, it, it will have a longer road to uh, see it to fruition? Um, you know, we're, we're optimistic uh, in terms of the changes we've proposed and in, in, uh, related to language. Um, we think all of that makes a difference. And so certainly it's something that we'll continue to put forward and, and pay attention to uh, as we put forward our, our uh, programs and initiatives. You know, we've uh, we've addressed uh, a lot of different populations and age groups in the course of our conversation. But I wonder if I could uh, ask you to comment. I, I uh, was uh, really delighted to see that SAMHSA also has initiatives to fund looking at the uh, mental health of very young children, children who are in our healthy starts and our early development centers. I'll give a shout out here in Connecticut uh, to a successful project uh, that we're involved in uh, down in the Fairfield County uh, portion of the state. And I, I was curious about that. Has that always been part of SAMHSA's work or is this a new initiative to focus on the youngest among our uh, our people and try and make a positive impact there on, on they and their families, of course? Yeah, so um, we do have a number of programs that focus on the younger, you know, uh, children, like really young, young children. And um, ultimately our aim is to, to um, address lifespan, you know, address behavioral health across the lifespan. And so, so um, we do have a, a number of programs, um, some which we've had, others which are newer, but we're looking to expand as well. Well, we're really delighted to see it. Getting, getting to those uh, young kids is very important. So congratulations on that good work. Thank you. Know, doc you. Dr. Thank you. Here in Connecticut, of course, we, uh, know you from your great work leading Connecticut State uh, Mental Health and Addiction Services. But I'm wondering when you were working in Hartford, did you ever think, I just wish the feds in Washington understood what we're going through at the state level? And uh, how, how is it that experience informing your leadership now that you're in uh, one of those hot seats? <laughs> yeah, great question. So, you know, um, that experience very much has, uh, it, it certainly has helped. It, it's helped in terms of, of my role and, uh, you know, current role. And, you know, 
when we hear from states or communities about um, you know ideas or recommendations or thoughts they have, um, it, it often sort of sparks some of the experiences that I'm aware of or that I'm bringing with me from Connecticut, and and so um, you know all of that I think um, contributes to my a- approach to leadership. Um, I love hearing from. Um, from states and uh, and from community members and grantees about what's working, what's not working. And that's something that I loved when I was commissioner as well. And, and so I think that's an important part of the work. Um, you know, I'm a clinical community psychologist by training. And so I, I certainly have taken that with me, whether it's in my role as commissioner or my current role as assistant secretary, um, that there's a collaborative element to this work that is this vital. You know, we, we um, ultimately are all moving forward uh, the behavioral health uh, um, uh, system of care across the nation together. Um, you know, the relationships and work we're doing with our grantees is just so vital. We know that we can't do this work alone. Um, and so that's why I often uh, look for opportunities to hear directly from young people or to hear directly from community members uh, and, and grantees at the, you know, local level or state level. And, uh, and so all of that, I think, makes a difference and, and sort of contributes to um, sort of my vision and approach to the work. Um, to include those experiences I had taking that approach in Connecticut as well. Well, we really appreciate uh, and admire that ability to uh, travel travel that uh, that that line between the micro and the community level uh, to the macro level and the the policy level. And and one of those uh, programs that I know uh, you've uh, been engaged with, that SAMHSA's been engaged with, I think for over 20 years, uh, that we just see play out, uh, certainly hear about it from our school-based health center uh, programs, is the issue of bullying uh, in schools. And I think ties back to a lot of the issues we talked about a little uh, bit earlier. 20 years as a SAMHSA initiative, what have we learned? Uh, what's involved in that work? Any uh, signs of effectiveness, success, metrics that we can point to around that just painful issue that kids often face. Yeah, you know, it is it is a, a painful issue. And, and one, you know, one thing that we're looking at right now, we recently funded the Social Media Center of Excellence. Um, and we know bullying, um, you know, one space, unfortunately, where that happens and where we're seeing challenges there um, is on social media. Um, so one of the things that our social media center of excellence is working on is, is developing um, strategies and approaches for schools, for families, for young folks um, around um, using social media um, in a way that's positive um, and strategies around um, managing and, and navigating and negotiating some of the more challenging aspects of social media to include bullying. Um, so that's one recent initiative that we're really excited mm-hmm. about. We awarded that center of excellence uh, earlier in the year, um, it was actually mentioned uh, as a, the president's mental health strategy. Uh, so we're really excited about that work because we know um, what we hear from young folks is that often uh, social media is one space um, where bullying happens, uh, unfortunately, to include others. Um, but we're looking to to sort of develop strategies uh, and approaches for young folks in terms of social media and, and navigating uh, um, bullying and challenges there. Assistant Secretary, let me let me get in one last question. Uh, I think there are so many natural disasters, uh, school shootings that are going on, other crisis events, and maybe some people think that FEMA is there. But I, I think also SAMHSA has a role that it's playing. And I'm, I'm not sure people understand the importance that you bring to these traumatic events uh, where people are facing anxiety, worry, insomnia, and the others. Maybe talk a little bit about, as we wrap up here, uh, the role that uh, the critical role that SAMHSA plays all across America. Yeah, no, thank you for that question. I mean, uh, especially now, as you know, as often springtime is just a really tough, tough time of year for weather events. Um, but we also run the the National Disaster Distress uh, Helpline, uh, and so that is um, a helpline that's available for people that are experiencing uh, challenges related to natural disasters. Um, another resource that often is is real valuable there is a national traumatic uh, the National Child Traumatic Stress Network. Mm-hmm. Um, that network includes this, a, a whole range of resources for children and families related to managing um, and negotiating traumatic uh, stress or traumatic events. Um, so between the disaster distress help uh, disaster distress helpline as well as the um, the National Child uh, 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 Traumatic Stress Network. Uh, there are a range of resources that are available for um, communities and children and families related to managing uh, traumatic events. 
Um, we also have a, a grant that uh, is available in addition to some of the, um, you know, the specific FEMA or other grants. Um, you know, there, there's a grant that we have for communities that have experienced, it's called Recast. Um, it's for communities that have experienced traumatic events related to um, cultural uh, or community unrest, uh, community violence, uh, or even natural disasters. And it's about forming uh, coalitions um, geared towards and, and other approaches and strategies geared towards promoting resilience, uh, you know, resilience for communities experiencing stress and trauma. Assistant Secretary Delphin Brittman, thank you for leading this fight and for joining us. And thank you to our audience. There's more online about conversations on healthcare, including a way to sign up for our updates. Our address is chcradio.com. Uh, Dr. Delphin Rittman, we can't thank you enough for joining us today. Continued good luck. Thank you so much. Thank you for having me on.